Welcome to Numerical Methods. So today I like to start a new chapter, a new session. And actually, this is also one of my favorite. I don't do it so often. Uh, we will discuss the valuation of Bermudan options in the Monte Carlo simulation. And yeah, we will learn the technique of American Monte Carlo. I will explain you later why it is called American. Yeah, Bermudan option, American option. Yeah, it's quite similar. American exercises at any time, Bermudan at a selected set of specific times. And what's behind this technique here that we will discuss is essentially how we estimate a conditional expectation within the Monte Carlo simulation. And this is a non-trivial task. And yeah, maybe you already guess yeah, conditional expectation is a very important operator. It's a very important technique. Um, and I will take you a little bit yeah, on a ride to, through this. Um, so we will first discuss a little bit how we value a Bermudan option. And there are sub subtle changes to the way we do it that create sometimes even massive improvements. Yeah. So one of these subtle changes we will learn today, yeah, it is actually where we make use of the conditional expectation estimator. And then, yeah, maybe in the next session, we will focus on how we estimate a conditional expectation. And also there, it is a little bit like a journey. Yeah, So we will move step by step yeah, from one method to the other method. And in the end, you will see that all these methods are actually just one method you know, with different choices of, say, basis functions or whatever. Yeah, so let's start maybe with a small motivation. So we learned the Monte Carlo method for the valuation of financial derivatives. And... Maybe a very big feature of the Monte Carlo method is its simplicity. So now we have all the tools. We have random number generators. Yeah, we have a nice separation of numerical methods, you know, Euler scheme and uh, the model. And these tools allow us to simulate, say, model primitives, yeah, the observed quantities on the market, different stocks, different interest rates. So X here could be a vector of quantities that we observe. So it simulates these random variables at different times, a time discrete stochastic process, and then assume that the financial product, so we have here a financial product. So this financial product pays you, say, a function of these observed quantities. Yeah? For example, a European option pays you maximum of the stock minus K and zero. An Asian option pays you maximum of the average of the stock you observed. So it may be that you need multiple observations here. Uh, it pays this, say, at time TI. So this is VI paid in TI. And the stuff you observe, of course, it has to be before TI. Yeah, You can only pay the quantities that you know. Yeah, You cannot pay something unknown. I cannot pay you today the value of tomorrow's stock yeah? because I don't know it. So clearly you have the assumption that all these observable quantities, the fixing times, they lie before the TI, before the payment time. And then you can define in your financial product such a stream of cash flows. And of course, the value of the stream of the cash flows is just the sum of all these values. So you just sum up these cash flows. Well, if VI is paid in TI, then the universal valuation theorem tells us that I have to divide the VI by the numerea I observe in TI, and then I take the expectation. So you can flip here sum and expectation because expectation is linear. So you can first all collect all the VIs divided by the numerea, and then you take the expectation. So we have here our yeah, Monte Carlo method, we take the expectation of the numerea relative values, and then we multiply with the numerea in evaluation time. And that's the value of our financial product uh, in T0. So really, now you plug in the 
function that represents the payment in terms of your observed quantities. So I have here my observed quantities, x observed in t1, x observed in t2, and so on, up to t ki, yeah? so the stuff that I need to calculate the payment in ti, the payment vi. Then you apply your uh, function of the financial product, maximum function, whatever that is, divide by the numerator, sum all these payments up, and you know, take then the Monte Carlo average, so sum up all the collected values and divide by the number of sample paths. Yeah? So this here is now my Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation. It looks a little bit as if I can value now any financial product, any cash flow stream that I observe. So looks as if this allows to value any payment stream. Well, there is a small restriction. The payment stream that relies on past observations. Yeah? So this is here my condition that I observed the X, of course, only in the past, past observation of my model primitive variable X. Yeah, now comes the issue. There are some financial products that depend, well, they cannot depend on future observations of quantities, yeah, because that would maybe yeah, break a little bit the measurability. Yeah, so my decision has to be FTI measurable, but they can rely on values, valuations of future cash flow. Yeah? So for example, I could pay you tomorrow the value of an option that pays something in one year. So evaluation that depends on evaluation of future payment, this could occur, and this is non-trivial. And an example for this is the Bermuden option. So let's have a look at a Bermuden option. So I first consider a very simple case. It is a Bermuden option with two exercise dates. So there are two times now, T1 and T2. And here the option holder has the right to receive some underlying. So this could be, for example, the stock. Maybe I take as an example here S minus K, say, for example, K1, if you like. But now, so he can take S minus K in T1, or he can wait and he retains the right to receive another underlying, the second underlying in T2. So an example for this is S of T2, maybe minus a strike K2, or he can even continue So he receives nothing. So this last step, continuing and receiving nothing, actually corresponds to taking S minus K2 in T2, maximum of this and zero. Huh? So you see that in time T2, he actually has a classical European option. He receives S of T2 minus K2 or nothing. Yeah? So he just takes the positive part. But in time T1, he now has the option to take S of T1 minus K1, the payoff of a European option in T1, or choose the next option. So what we have in time T1 is actually a, an option on an option. So you can decide whether to choose the payoff of the European now, or choose another European option that pays later. Yeah, how would you value this option on an option? Well, you would of course choose the maximum value. So what do you get if you exercise in T1? 
if you exercise now, compared to the value of the option, the option that pays in T2, but the value of this option observed in T1. So we have to perform evaluation of future cash flows, yeah, future payments in time T1. So this year, yeah, you can just write down the valuation formula. Yeah, It is the expectation under the equivalent martingale measure of the future payoff. So my future payoff is maximum of S of T2 minus K2 and zero divided by the numeraire. This is paid into two, so divided by the numeraire in T2. But this is now evaluated conditional to where we have arrived in T1. So conditional expectation to where we are in T1 multiplied with the numeraire in T1. Yeah, so you see there could be some kind of difference in this valuation depending on if you have arrived here or if you have arrived here. Yeah? So if you have arrived below, yeah, you would maybe try to value the future payoff conditional to being here. And if you have arrived above, yeah, so you would try to value the future cash flow conditional to being arrived here. Yeah? So these things here, they now form the conditional expectation operator. So the conditional expectation operator is a random variable. It is FT1 measurable. So this means I can decide upon this random variable. I have knowledge about this random variable here at this time. So I can compare it to the other value and place my decision. But yeah, I need some future values here to calculate this. Yeah, so this is a very nice um, example. So you have an option on an option. Yeah, so you can decide on getting the option in T1 and getting the underlying of the under, other option later. So the value of the Bermudian option with two exercise dates, yeah, T1 and T2, observed in T1. This is choose the maximum well, of what you get if you exercise in T1 into the underlying or what you get if you don't exercise and take the later option. And this later option, of course, is also just take the underlying observed in T2, yeah, maximum of this and zero. So this is a, just a classical European. But in my decision, I have to use the value of this. So I have to use the value of this. This means I have to take here the conditional expectation to get the value of this option in T1. And then this is plugged in to the maximum function yeah, to decide yeah, if you exercise or not. Also note that your exercise decision is based on random variables that are FT1 measurable. Yeah? Well, let's see FT1 measurable. Small picture, this is the situation. You can decide to choose the underlying. Yeah? You can just make this decision here in T1 or you can decide to continue. You know, and if you continue, you have again the decision to choose the underlying in T2 you know, or choose nothing. This is the example with two exercises. Yeah, and now you can just continue here yeah, and you have more and more exercise decisions. You can exercise this option at different future time, you have the right to exercise into this underlying once, yeah, or you can continue. 
So there is a very strong relation to the ability to calculate the conditional expectation. So this was here already on my slide. So the big issue is that we need the conditional expectation operator. Yeah? All the other stuff here is trivial. Yeah, Use the maximum function on two random variables, but this guy is the important part. So there's a strong relation to the ability to calculate the conditional expectation. And the calculation of a conditional expectation, this is non-trivial within a Monte Carlo simulation. So there are two main issues, and we will learn these issues yeah, soon. So one is the complexity. For example, if you use re-simulation, the effort, the computational time, yeah, so the effort needed to calculate the value of the Bermudan grows exponentially with the number of exercise states. And the other issue is foresight bias. So if you use some approximations, yeah, you may have a very strong bias in your valuation. So I will start by considering here the valuation of the Bermudan option, but this is, well, an example. The remainder, say, the next session is actually focused on how we estimate the conditional expectation operator. And these methods, yeah, they are not limited to Bermudan option pricing. So you can apply them in many different contexts where, where you need a conditional expectation operator within the Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah, let's start with Bermudan options. So let's define the Bermudan option in a more general way. So I consider a time discretization, T1 to Tn. This is my set of exercise states. Yeah? At these times, you have the right to exercise the option. You have this right once, yeah. So the Bermudan option is the right to receive at one and only one of these exercise times, Ti, a corresponding value of an underlying. So in addition to my exercise times, to the vector of exercise times, I have a vector or a set here of underlines. So these V underlines, it could be just as an example, value of the stock in Ti minus Ki, yeah, some strike Ki. But this can be very general. Yeah? For example, in interest rates, the underlying is often just a swap yeah, with remaining periods yeah, up to a certain maturity. Yeah? So the swap becomes shorter and shorter. So you have the uh, option to exercise into a swap yeah, or something else. So the Bermudan option is the right to receive at one and only one of these times the corresponding underlying. Well, in the end, you receive nothing. Yeah, you could also say that the last underlying is just a constant uh, zero. So the value of the Bermudan option can be defined by the optimal exercise strategy. So the optimal exercise strategy compares the value of the product I receive upon exercise. So this means I receive here my underlying to the value that I get if I don't exercise. So the value of the product, which I get if I don't exercise. So what's that? Yeah, that's a Bermudan option with fewer exercise states. So you have here the Bermudan option that has the right to exercise in Ti 
Ti plus one and so on up to Tn. Yeah, if you do not exercise in time Ti, you still have the right to exercise in Ti plus one, Ti plus two up to time Tn. Yeah? So you have the remaining exercise rights if you don't exercise. If you exercise, yeah, the Ben Newton option is exercised, it's uh, terminated and you get the underlying. So at each time Ti, this is your optimal decision. And note that you make this decision by comparing the Ti values. Yeah. So what you see here is the value of a Bermudan option with exercise dates Ti plus one up to Tn evaluated in time Ti. Yeah? So evaluated at the time step before. So this decision here is, you would say, FTI measurable, or the quantities are FTI measurable. Yeah. And this thing here is the value of the Bermudan option for the future part, future exercise states evaluated at the earlier time. Yeah. So this is here evaluated in TI, yeah, but it's also the Bermudan option that additionally has this exercise state, TI. So this is the step applying the optimal exercise. And of course, there has to be an additional step. This here is the evaluation. So it's numeraire in TI multiplied with the condition expectation of the Bermudan option with the exercise states Ti plus one up to Tn. This guy observed in Ti plus one divided by the numeraire and Ti plus one, and then take the conditional expectation. So this is now how I get from this definition evaluated in TI yeah, to this def definition here, yeah, evaluated at the earlier, oh, sorry, that way, uh, evaluated at the earlier time step. Yeah, my uh, backward induction here, of course, starts by initializing the Bermudan option at the final time to zero because in the end I receive zero. Okay, if you look at this uh, formula here, yeah, it looks a little bit ugly. Yeah, or also if you go back to here our example, it looks a little bit ugly because yeah, we have to divide by the numeraire at time t two and then we multiply with the numeraire at time t one. You can make the algorithm or the definition you know, a little bit more elegant if you move to relative prices, numeraire relative prices. So all the quantities should be divided by the numeraire at their valuation time. So I move now to relative prices. So this means to numeraire relative prices. This means I divide all these quantities here by the numeraire, by the numeraire at the corresponding valuation time. So if I place a tilde on top of my symbol, this is the numeraire relative value. So V tilde underlying I of, so observed, evaluated in Tj, Tj smaller than, smaller or equal than Ti. So evaluated at an earlier point in time. This is just the underlying I of Tj divided by the numeraire N of Tj. And the same for the Bermuden. And maybe I also ease a little bit the notation. Yeah, I drop here the listing of the exercise dates, yeah, and just add here a small index, yeah. So V tilde Bermuden I is the Bermuden option that is allowed to exercise in Ti, Ti plus one, and so on up to Tn. 
So VTIL, Bermudan I of TJ, so evaluated in TJ, is the Bermudan with these exercise states evaluated in TJ divided by N of TJ. So then the advantage is if you have these relative prices, you can just write the valuation formula without this multiply with the numeraire in TI divide by the numeraire in TI plus one. Yeah? So if we go one step back, yeah, it's just take the conditional expectation of the numeraire relative value gives you the numeraire relative value. Okay, it's just because you can move this multiplicative factor here by dividing it to the other side. So also here, yeah. So you divide by this guy and you have here a divided by n of t1 and you see that on both sides now I have just the numeraire relative values. Take the conditional expectation on the numeraire relative values. And now you have a very nice yeah, interleaving of taking the conditional expectation of the future value uh, of the Bermudan option. So go back with the evaluation of the future Bermudan to the earlier time point. And then at this earlier time point, so take this Bermudan here from TI plus one, apply conditional expectation to get the value of this Bermudan in TI. And then at this earlier time point, the time point TI, compare this value of the future Bermudan with your underlying to get the Bermudan value in TI, so the, to get the ice Bermudan value in TI. So you see the process of defining the Bermudan value is interleaving, yeah, taking conditional expectation, take the maximum with what you get if you exercise, Again, take conditional expectation, take the maximum of what you get if you exercise, and so on. So we nicely step backward here, and this is the backward induction that defines the value of the Bermudan. So this here is the definition, yeah, and this is also maybe already some kind of algorithm how to value the Bermudan. You have to be a little bit careful, yeah, if you consider these things as stochastic process. So this process related to the underlying here, and this process related to my Bermudan here, they are FT conditional expectations of the future values. And of course they are martingales. But if you look at V tilde underlying I observed in TI, then this is not a martingale. Uh, actually, it can be anything because you receive um, the underlying I in TI and in I plus one, you receive the underlying I plus one, which could be something completely different. Uh, so these are just different objects that you receive and hence also the Bermudan, yeah, we till the Bermudan I observed in TI, yeah, is something that is altered, yeah, by just adding more and more um, exercise options or removing more and more exercise options. So if you fix these things here, then these are just value processes. If you modify it, yeah, you have to be a little bit careful. There is another important quantity which I would like to introduce, and this is the first step, uh, writing the Bermudan valuation in a different form. Well, with this quantity here, the optimal exercise time, I can write the value of the Bermudan as a single unconditional expectation. Okay, yeah, maybe you think, okay, that's that's nice, yeah, because Unconditional expectation in Monte Carlo is easy. Yeah? Just sample and take the expectation and you are done. So we introduce the 
optimal exercise time. And this guy, it's a time, but it's a random variable. Yeah? So T is a random variable. So it's a stochastic time. And how do I define it? So T of omega is the minimum of all my exercise times. So it's the first exercise time, Ti, where the underlying value is larger than the value of the future Bermuden, so the value of continuation. So this is the first exercise time where I observe that the underlying has a higher value than continuing. So this is the time when I exercise. But of course, you make this comparison here on your sample path omega, no? well, on the objects that are in the filtration FTI, yeah, in the sigma algebra FTI. So given the information that you have in TI, you make this on this omega. So this is a random variable. Yeah? So the decision, going back to this picture, the decision can be different here from here. Yeah? So the decision depends on whether I'm on that sample path or that sample path. Yeah? must be FT1 measurable. So the decision has to be the same on that sample pass compared to that sample pass no? because they have the same past and a different future. Okay, so this random variable encodes the exercise strategy. So it's an equivalent description of the exercise strategy. Because if I plug in uh, an uh, omega, yeah, it tells me what is the corresponding time to exercise the option. If I have this random variable, the stochastic time capital T here, so this is my optimal exercise strategy capital T, I can now express the value of the Bermudan in a very elegant form. So let's define a time discrete stochastic process. Yeah, So this is my U tilde. And the U tilde is defined on the times T1, T2 here, yeah? so on the exercise times. So U tilde of Ti is the underlying that I receive if I exercise in time Ti. So it's a time discrete stochastic process that is going through all these underlying step by step. So if you plug in T1, yeah, you get the value of the underlying that you receive in T1 evaluated in T1. Then the claim is that the value of my Bermudan option observed in time T0 is just the U tilde evaluated at my stochastic time, the expectation of that random variable. So this here is a random variable. Okay, so what random variable is it? Yeah, you have U tilde of capital T. This is my claim, it's, it's a random variable. So I plug in an omega. So this is then U tilde at the time T evaluated on this sample pass omega. So this means this thing here is now take the underlying that you have at the corresponding exercise time, because this here is some of these TIs, yeah, some TJ. But then this object here is still a random variable. Okay, then you have to apply the omega. 
Okay, and then the U tilde of this T omega is, of course, the value V tilde of the underlying, say, some K here, yeah, evaluated in TK. Okay, evaluated in TK and on the sample path omega for some TK. Yeah, TK is the T of this omega. So plug in the stochastic time in the time discrete stochastic process gives you a random variable. This is what I have now here under the expectation operator. Yeah, but this is exactly the payment that I get in the future from this Bermuden. The Bermuden will pay me the corresponding underlying value at the corresponding exercise time. This is exactly the random variable that describes all the future payments. And since we have this nice notation here with the tilde, all these payments are already divided by their respective numeria, yeah? the respective numeria, and also evaluated at the capital T at the corresponding stochastic payment time. Yeah, this is a very nice expression here for the Bermuden. So you see, you can value the Bermuden with a single unconditional expectation, given that you know this stochastic time here. So we got rid of all this ugly interleaving here with the maximum. Once we have this stochastic time, yeah, we also got, got rid of the conditional expectation. Well, actually not. Because if you go back to the definition, you see that the stochastic time capital T is defined by comparing the value of the future Bermuden. And this already contains the valuation of the Bermuden. This already contains here the conditional expectation. So maybe it's just another nice short representation of the valuation, but actually it did not sol solve uh, anything. But we got yeah, one step closer to uh, a nice solution because now I can define an algorithm that constructs this random variable u tilde of t. And this algorithm is the backward algorithm. Okay, so just uh, as a summary, what I wrote on the pre previous slide, yeah, so how you should understand this random variable, yeah, it is u tilde evaluated on the stochastic time, then evaluated on the sample pass. So let's have a look at the backward algorithm. So this is also the algorithm that I use to implement the evaluation of the Bermuden. And this is the thing where we have this little remark from my introduction, where there is a very nice, very subtle modification to our Bermuden valuation, yeah, to our Bermuden definition, that really makes a big difference, that really changes the accuracy of the valuation algorithm by yeah, order of magnitudes. So the random variable u tilde of t, this can be constructed in the Monte Carlo simulation through the backward algorithm. Given our exercise criteria, okay, so what was that? So 47, so my exercise criteria was just compare the value of the Bermuden with the future exercise dates to the underlying. And for, for this, of course, I need the conditional expectation operator because I need to value the Bermuden in the future. Note that valuing the Bermuden, the future Bermuden, is like valuing U tilde yeah, with the stochastic time that is just constructed using the future exercise dates. So I now iteratively 
construct random variables. These random variables are here the u tilde i. Uh, the u tilde i is not the same as u tilde of ti. So it's just the iterative construction. But we will have that the u tilde 1 will be my u tilde of capital T. Yeah? So the collection of all the future random variables or the, the collection of all the future underlyings stopped at the right moment at the optimal exercise time. So here's the algorithm. I initialize u tilde n plus 1 to 0. So this is just if the Bermuden runs on, yeah, you will in the end receive nothing. And then I go backward in time. So we step back from ti plus 1. Yeah? So actually ti plus 1 uh, for the last step n, yeah? tn plus 1 does not exist. Yeah? So we step to ti. So we go to tn for in the first step. But we step backward in time. And I now define the u tilde i by, here is my Bermuden exercise criteria. So compare the value of the underlying in ti to the value that you receive if you continue. So my claim is by backward induction that the conditional expectation of this u tilde i plus 1, this is the value of the Bermuden that has remaining exercise states from ti plus 1 to tn. So then I can use here the u tilde of u tilde i plus 1. So this thing there is just my my Bermuden option value if I continue. Yeah? So also note, you compare all this in time ti. So this is my exercise criteria. Yeah? If the underlying has a higher value, okay, then I choose the underlying. If not, I choose the value that I would get if I continue. So in my first iteration, that would be just the zero. So you see in the end, you just have a European option. So you choose the value that you get if you continue. And then in the next time step, you see that this is choose the underlying for the next time or choose the underlying at the current time. So you can show here with the tower law. Yeah? So tower law is that conditional expectation of a conditional expectation is just the outer conditional expectation. That if you apply here the conditional expectation operator, yeah, then this is just having here the conditional expectation operator. This here is already FTI measurable, so you don't need a conditional expectation operator there. And so you see that this is exactly the conditional expectation of the U tilde I is exactly the value of the Bermuden I. You know? Because if you apply the conditional expectation here, you have a conditional expectation here, and then by induction, by backward induction, this is just deciding between the Bermuden value and the underlying value. So if you go now backward over all those times, I arrive in time T1, and then I have the final result that the expectation of the U1 is just the value of the Bermuden with all the exercise states. Maybe we have a small illustration what's going on here. So on the left side, you see the different underlines. So in time T4, yeah, maybe you get these red values here. This is my underlying 
4. In time t3, maybe you can get these green values here. This is my underlying 3 and so on. So you have the option to exercise into one of these underlyings as you go along this sample path. So I start initializing my U4 with what I receive if I never exercise, if I go to the end. Yeah, so I never exercise and I go to the end and that's what I receive. So maybe that's the vectors of zeros if you like. And then you, you take from this guy here, the conditional expectation. So this would be take this vector and take the conditional expectation now to time T3. This means evaluate what you get there to the earlier time. And this evaluation is then compared to what you would receive if you exercise. So I go back and now I compare the conditional expectation with what I receive if I exercise. And maybe you observe that here the conditional expectation is larger and there the conditional expectation is smaller than the corresponding uh, underlying, which would mean that you choose on these sample path here to exercise in the underlying T3. So here we have the question, is the underlying three, observed in three, is it smaller or larger than the conditional expectation of my U tilde four conditional to do time T3? Then you apply again the conditional expectation operator to this guy here. Okay, so you apply conditional expectation, now conditional to F2. And you compare the value of this conditional expectation to what you get if you exercise into the underlying in T2. And maybe you observe that the conditional expectation is larger in these cases here in these cases here, but the underlying is larger in these cases here. So you would exercise into the blue dots yeah, for the two sample paths that are there below. So you see your U2 has now updated here to this vector, yeah, and then you continue, and here in T1, maybe there's one other exercise here. Yeah, the others are just do not exercise. Okay, and we have found the vector U1 and the claim was that the expectation of this sample vector, this random vector, random variable here, this is the value of the Ben Newton option. Okay, this is the backward algorithm. And now comes the subtle modification that we did. So I made here this remark that if you take the conditional expectation of this guy here, then you have the conditional expectation of the u tilde i plus one, which corresponds to having the value of the Bermuda. So the definition of the Bermuden valuation algorithm did not decide between these two guys. Yeah? The decision is between the underlying and the condition expectation. And it took the underlying, if the underlying has a higher value, or it took the future value of the Bermuden if that has a higher value. So if you go back to that other slide, yeah. It is compare these two and take either the underlying or the value of the Bermudan. So take the conditional expectation if you don't exercise. So if I translate this one to one, 
to this algorithm, there should be actually here the conditional expectation, there should be actually here this expression. Now, I have an argument that I do not need this. So the recursive formula that we have, this definition of u tilde i differs a little bit from our recursive definition of the value of the Bermuden. So in the definition of the value of the Bermuden, we had the same exercise criteria. So compare the underlying to the value of the Bermuden, but we choose between the value of the Bermuden and the underlying. And that was the update yeah, for the next Bermuden. Here we have the same criteria to make the decision, but the update for our value is, yeah, take the underlying if you exercise, but if you do not exercise, you do not take the conditional expectation, you take the random variable representing the future values. And you also see this subtle difference if you look at the random variable that is constructed here, this random variable here is FTI measurable. This random variable is also FTI measurable. So this guy is FTI measurable. It is the value of the Bermudan observed in TI. But this random variable here is just a collection of what you get in the future on different sample paths. So going back to our picture, you see this random variable, u tilde one, it contains here on these sample paths, stuff that you get here. It contains here, stuff that you get here, here, stuff that you get there. Okay, it's just a collection of different objects from the future without having the conditional expectation operator applied. Huh? So this is FTI measurable. This is, well, we don't know. Yeah, this is FTN measurable. Taking the expectation of the two gives the same value. And why is now this subtle modification so important? Well, the thing is that the conditional expectation this has to be estimated. Yeah? I have to introduce what we will do in the next session, um, a numerical method that estimates this guy here. And this numerical method may have an error. And sometimes this error is very large. If you take the upper part, maybe I call the upper part now star, because I need that later. If you take the upper part, you make this error only in the decision, but you do not make this error in the value. The values are just the true values that you would get. Maybe to make the wrong decision, but you will get still the correct value. If you take the lower guy, let's call it hash, yeah, then you also have this conditional expectation operator here. And if this is a numerical method, if it is an approximation, you also have the approximation error in all your values. You make the wrong decision and you get a little bit the wrong value. So this is a very important remark here on the slide repeated again. Yeah. Note here, the exercise decision is the only place where we apply the conditional expectation, an estimate of the conditional expectation, this reduces the error significantly. So see figure 37. So that's maybe a nice illustration now. So this is uh, the example of a Bermudan option with two exercise dates. Yeah? So this here is a Bermudan. For example, you could say that you have the option to receive maximum of your stock value observed in T2 
minus K2 and zero. So this is this payoff function here. Okay, this is my V2 observed in T2. Well, this payoff function here, this strike K2, this is a function of the stock S observed in T2. So on my horizontal axis, actually it's an overlay of two pictures. So we have this option to receive this guy, or I can decide to receive in T1, the maximum of the stock that I observe in time T1 minus K1. So maybe a different strike and zero. So this is now the payoff of this option here. So this is my V1 T1. Yeah, it's a function of the stock observed in T1. And um, when would you exercise? Well, to make the exercise decision in T1, you have to compare the V1, so the underlying if you exercise in T1, with the value of the option that you receive if you don't exercise, so that's VT2. But this guy evaluated, so observed in T1. Yeah, so this is Numerea in T1 multiplied with expectation of the value if I continue observed in T2 divided by the numerea in T2, but now conditional to F2, FT1. So I have to evaluate this payoff here. So this payoff here is what I get in time T2 but I have to evaluate it. And if you evaluate that, you get something that looks like a Black Scholes formula. Huh? So that is maybe like that. Yeah, the value of the option is a little bit higher than the value of the payoff. Yeah, this is uh, the payoff is the intrinsic value because even if here is the strike K2, yeah, even if the stock is currently here, the value of the option is not zero. If the stock would stay here, the value that you receive is zero, but the value of the option is a little bit higher because there is still a chance that the stock can move to another value where you get some payoff. Okay, that's the reason why this curved line here lies a little bit above yeah, and it's curved because you have diffusion because your Brownian motion creates different chances yeah, to, to arrive uh, at, at higher or well, smaller values. So now I have to decide whether I exercise or not. So my exercise criteria is here. So is the value, or maybe I take the pen. So my exercise criteria, my optimal exercise is here. So is the value of the underlying larger than the observed value of the option that I have in T2. So the optimal exercise is I choose the underlying if the underlying value is higher. So the optimal exercise, maybe I draw that. So I choose the underlying. So I choose the V1. If the V1 value is higher, but then here at that point, I observe that taking the option, the option value has a higher value. I choose here the, the option to continue. So I don't exercise. So this here is my point where I flip from choosing V1, choosing the underlying to continuing, yeah, not exercising. So you see this corresponds to the stock being larger than this eta star. So this is the yeah, analytic, or this is the theoretical optimal strategy. If the stock observed in T1 is larger than eta star, then you would exercise, you would take V1, otherwise you would continue. This is also the correct 
criteria because the S of T1 is FT1 measurable and actually observing S of T1 is sufficient for the decision because uh, in the Black-Scholes formula, yeah, in the valuation of here, this blue curve, this guy here, the, there is no path dependency. For an Asian option, uh, S of T1 is maybe not enough to make this decision. Yeah, you also need to know which path uh, you walk along. Yeah, if you walk along, uh, yeah, this way, or if you go down and then up. Yeah, this this changes in the Asian option maybe the criteria. But here in this example of the two Europeans, observing the stock in T one is enough to make this exercise decision. And this here is my optimal exercise. This is here my my optimal exercise point. Yeah, this is the exercise boundary. So now what happens if I do not have an exact formula for this conditional expectation operator? In Black-Scholes, I have an exact formula. I can just compare the underlying to the Black-Scholes formula and decide by that. But what if the E is, say, some poor estimate. So now here this orange line is an estimate of the V2 of T1, which has maybe some approximation error. Okay, here in this example, it lies a little bit below. The first effect is that we make our decision at the wrong point. So if now the orange line is what my algorithm has as the V2 of T1. Yeah, then you see I'm still above here, the orange line. So I would exercise into the underlying because I believe the option, uh, when I continue, has a smaller value. And then here, I see that the orange line is above and I would con continue. So this eta tilde here is the point where I exercise if I use this approximation. So I make the exercise decision at a slightly different point due to my poor estimate of the conditional expectation operator. So this is what happens if I have here some approximation for the conditional expectation. Yeah, I make this decision here based on the approximation and I have an error in this decision. But what happens now if you choose either this or this version where you have here the true continuation value and here you also choose now this approximation. If you have the true continuation value, we would actually get really the true value what we get if we continue. Uh, so we actually get this guy here. And since we can evaluate an European option quite accurately, that corresponds to get in expectation actually really this blue line here. Yeah. If I use the poor approximation, in my valuation, I I take this value here in my valuation. So the error I make if I take the hash, so if I take here the expectation, yeah. So if I take this guy here, the error that I have is this area here. Okay. And then I the true solution should should switch. So this is the error if we use the backward algorithm with the conditional expectation also in the value part. Yeah, if we take the upper part, we get the correct value here but we make the wrong decision. So what happens is that we take here the 
non-exercise value. So we continue, but we get the right value. And then we say, okay, I exercise here. So I jump down and I take the queen line. So you see by taking the correct value, using the wrong decision, the error that you make is just this part here. So this is much smaller. And yeah, maybe to conclude, another explanation for this is the Bermudan option is doing an optimal exercise. So when something is optimal, the derivative with respect to a change in the parameter is zero. Yeah? Okay, find the optimal, find the optimum, set derivative to zero. So this means the first order change in changing the exercise decision yeah, is zero. Yeah? It doesn't make a big change. So this is a small, only a small change. But choosing the uh, approximation also in the value will get you a first order error. Yeah? So it will completely expose you to this um, approximation error. So maybe we can also play a little bit in a computer with this, and you can see that this has a really, really big effect. Yeah? And you see it's just a very small modification of the algorithm. Okay, so here in the script, you also find a little bit the remark on the measurability that I previously made. Okay, the Bermuden random variable, yeah, this guy is, FTI measurable if the value is the, that of the Bermuden in TI, but our constructed random variable U tilde I, yeah, so this is FTN measurable, yeah, so because it collects all these uh, future values. Also, a remark on the naming. So my underlying, so the value that I receive upon exercise, yeah, this is sometimes called the exercise value. And this random variable u tilde i plus one. So the value, if I do not exercise in TI, if I continue, the value that I receive, if I continue, this is called the continuation value. Yeah, the collection of all the future uh, underlines. And I make this remark in the beginning. So an American option is an option that is allowed to exercise at any time. A Bermudan option is an option that is allowed to exercise at selected times, at discrete times. So if you look yeah, to what you see on the market, then an American option actually also only exercises at selected times because it exercises once a day at, say, maybe a specific um, uh, time. Yeah, So sometimes this is the case. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and since conditional expectation is needed in the evaluation of Bermudan options, sometimes methods that approximate conditional expectations in a Monte Carlo simulation, these methods are called American Monte Carlo, yeah, because they are the techniques required to value American options, Bermudan options. So the valuation of the Bermudan, yeah, is maybe done now. It can be reduced to the calculation of conditional expectations. And we will need to study now uh, approximation methods approximating the conditional expectation operator. Yeah, maybe I discuss two simple methods, you know, the re-simulation and the foresight bias. And both these methods do not work, yeah, but maybe they give you a little bit intuition. And then we will discuss here in this section, in the next session, the methods that really work. So of course you can do 
re-simulation. Yeah. You can just move with your sample path to the corresponding time, and then you can start a new Monte Carlo simulation at that time and sample path. You move with your sample path to a different place at that time and start a new Monte Carlo simulation. So that looks like that. Yeah. So this means you have a first Monte Carlo simulation going to this point, and then you start another Monte Carlo simulation starting from this point here. And this is then, this Monte Carlo simulation is then estimating the conditional expectation in this point here. Of course, if you would like to estimate the conditional expectation at this point here, you would need to have another Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah. So this is what you have if you arrive here. Uh, you create another Monte Carlo simulation, conditional that this is the starting point, Yeah, conditional that this is the initial value of your model, you create another Monte Carlo simulation. So you see that if this Monte Carlo simulation has the number of sample paths n superscript 1, and each of these Monte Carlo simulations would have the number of sample paths n superscript 2, so also this guy here. Yeah, then you see that you need n1 times number n2 sample paths. You, know, you see that the total amount of sample paths, uh, random numbers and whatsoever, this grows exponentially. Okay, and that uh, does not work. Yeah, if you have more and more options, yeah, it's actually impractical. The complexity and so our calculation term grows um, exponentially. Yeah, but maybe a small, yeah, if you just have two exercises, you could try it as a benchmark yeah, to check your implementation. And it's also a good intuition of actually what we are what we are doing, so what we would like to achieve. There is another thing that we could do, and this is we just take one sample path for the re-simulation, namely the sample path that we already have. So assume that this is your Monte Carlo simulation that you have. And you would like to calculate now the conditional expectation here, say, at this time, T1. So this is my time, T1. So I would like to have the value if I if I end, end here, and I would like to have the value if I end here. Then I could do a Monte Carlo simulation with just a single sample pass. I continue just with a single sample pass. And I take this value. So you just take the future value that you get if you just continue this single sample pass. So this corresponds to just having a single sample pass for the re-simulation. Of course, you see this is n1 times 111. This does not grow. But you also see that you make a very high numerical error. You have a Monte Carlo simulation with one sample pass. That's a high numerical error. And there's another effect. You have knowledge about the future. Yeah? So actually you have knowledge about the future means you can make a difference if you go like here, you reach maybe the same point and then you deviate. Yeah? Your condition expectation operator is not FT1 measurable. It has knowledge about the future. It knows where you will end. And this, that you know where you end, this is foresight. So this creates a bias. Yeah. So you can exercise in a super optimal way yeah, because you have knowledge of what will happen in the future. So here's a very short um, example yeah, for yeah, to conclude this session. Two exercise times, uh, just two sample paths. Both sample paths have the same probability, one half. 
Um, they have the same past. Yeah? So this here is the past. Yeah. So this point here is my sigma field F T one. Yeah. So this just contains the empty set and the full set. And I would like to calculate the conditional expectation at this time here. Well, the conditional expectation at this time is just the expectation of these two values. So if you do perfect foresight, oh, let's, let's, let's do the good case. If you would take the conditional expectation, so conditional expectation of the value that you receive in T2 conditional to say T1. So this is one half four plus one half one. Yeah? So this is five over two, this is 2.5. Would you exercise or not? No, you would not exercise because your underlying value V1 of T1, this is just two. Yeah? So you receive two here or you can continue and you receive four here and one there. So you would continue. Of course, since you have to base your decision on what happens here in T1, you always continue. So now with perfect foresight, well, your conditional expectation is falsely approximated by just taking the value that you observe in the end. So your conditional expectation is either the four, if I am on path omega one, or the one. So if you take this as your conditional expectation estimator, your decision is now super optimal because on omega one, you continue on omega two, you exercise. No? You continue here because the four is larger than the two. And here you exercise because the one is smaller than the two. You have knowledge about the future because your estimator is actually not FT1 measurable. It has this knowledge about your future. So you see valuing the Bermudan option with this foresight will generate a much higher value. So here you get the best value 2.5. And here we get for the Bermudan where we get one half continue plus one half exercise. Yeah, So we actually get six divided by two, which is three. So I have a foresight bias. I have super optimal exercise. The option value is far too high. So here in the script, just the description yeah, of what I just did with my pen and the conclusion that perfect foresight is, of course, not suitable for estimating the uh, conditional expectation. I will continue with this numerical experiment in the next session. Actually, it's a computer experiment that I would like to implement a little bit this method, because then yeah, we maybe have this as a recap and also seeing the things in the computer is always helpful to understand the method. But you can maybe try it out if you like at home. This is just recreating here our figure, this figure here with the computer. That was it for today. Thanks.